All right, I'm testing this. All right, we are in verse 11 and now 12 of Exodus 34. Again, God is forgiving the people for the, the great sin of the golden calf. And God is saying, I renew the covenant. Um, specifically, God's renewal of the covenant here is the promised land. Uh, reminding them God's promised since Abraham in, in Genesis, this promised land. So how is it going to happen? How will God do the marvelous and awesome things? God will give them the land. Verse 11, observe what I command you. See, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Not going to get into the different names of these different clans or tribes. But I do want to get into what does this mean? Um, verse 12, take care not to make covenant with the inhabitants of the land. That will be the land of Israel. Uh, right now they're in the wilderness. They still have much time that they have to get through all these wilderness wanderings in the Old Testament before they properly are inhabiting the promised land. But this forgiveness that God extends is renewing this covenant um, God is going to open up space, driving out other people from the promised land. Now, we've talked about this before, but I want to maybe offer a different perspective or kind of uh, re remind you of how we think about this. Because quite often people will ask, or when I read this, my own conscience, you know, our own morality today thinks about, well, what about the Canaanites, you know, and how were they driven out? And it, does that feel right to us? Well, understand First, it's not even described that God would do this in a violent way. Certainly in the Old Testament, and we've seen other examples, you know, primitive people quite often warring with one another. Of course, that happens today, too, over land, doesn't it? Not, not to get into the current war again, but it could be that God might use other forces. God might use drought or famine to move people. So that could happen as well. But what I think we know for sure, what we can say, I think that helps the morality understanding is this. This description by God is not a jihad. It's not a holy war. God is not calling the Israelite people to war, uh, but it will be a work of God over a long period of time to draw people out of and make room for God's people, the Hebrews, into the promised land. So it's complex. Um, again, uh, let me read verse 13 because some of this sounds repetitious, but I want to try to go a little deeper or a little further with it maybe this time. Um, we haven't finished verse 12. Take care not to make covenant with the inhabitants. Talking about Canaanites as a general uh, tribal name for the people in the land of Canaan. Um, or it will become a snare to you. You shall tear down their altars, break their pillars, and cut down their sacred poles. Okay, there's a lot there. Let me try to get into it a little bit, so bear with me. Um, again, in Exodus, the emphasis is on pagan worship of other gods, and God's basically saying, don't do that. Don't mess around with that kind of worship. It'll be a snare. What's that? It's a trap. Um, at least a stumbling block. It's not going to help you to fulfill those Ten Commandments and to be God's holy people different from the rest of the world if you act like them. So take down their places of worship, their sacred poles or pillars, depending on your Bible. Um, your study notes, you may have seen... Uh, Asherah is one of the polytheistic religious cults. This, um, I think in, um, let's say, Greco-Roman mythology, it would equate to the goddess Venus. So think fertility, sexuality. And these poles, uh, just to give you a description, it may be like pole dancing. Okay, forgive me, but, uh, you know, like a strip club or something, that sort of sexualized dancing is uh, uh, what is inferred here in these places of worship. Uh, never mind the details, okay? Ready to move on? But that's, that's what it was. Uh, no kidding. Uh, these other religions, uh, their, 
their practices, the pagan practice of primitive people, involved sexuality and human sacrifice. So that's what God is against and wanting them to take down those other places of worship when they get into the land. So let me do a little exploration with you, um, a question for our time. Do we worship other gods? Is that even a problem for us today? Short answer, no, we don't worship other gods. Uh, more in-depth, realistic answer, I'm looking at some of your faces. Maybe, maybe we do. I mean, think about it. Depending on your level of um, comfort with Holy Spirit conviction in your heart, you could think about whether or not there are any other tempting, we probably wouldn't say gods, we would say competing loyalties, right? In our time, we've got nationalism, financial commitments, relationship loyalties, oh, and many more. Let's just keep it on a personal level. Any individual could struggle with ego, greed, anger and resentments that we harbor. And all, all of these things, if we're not careful, any one of them could take a higher place in our thought life, in our actions and decision making than God. Um, so there is something to be said for that. And while we don't have pagan cults necessarily that tempt us like the Hebrews back then, we do have our own issues, don't we? And I think we have, we live in a time and in a place where we have among us many different religions, the religions of the world, uh, represent, and they're growing. I don't know if you've paid attention, but now in America there are more Muslims than there are Episcopals. I don't even know if you know any Episcopals. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to pick on Episcopals. Slip up your hand if you're Episcopalian. I'll, I'll have an affidavit afterwards. I'll sign for you. Apologize. Uh, it, just tease out. You know, we may not even track sort of the, the modern trend among Christians in America. I think we hear things occasionally in the news and things, Gallup poll, you know, fewer, fewer people going to church and so on. But, but a lot of the world religions are growing really well. Christianity is growing in other places than, than North America around the world, but do we tolerate other religions in our land? Yeah, I mean, we sure do, right? Because United States, think about who we are. The Constitution itself guarantees religious freedom, so it's fine to tolerate, um, but we don't drive them out of the land, right? So that we don't have that sort of exodus style uh, I would say, living in a world like we do with many religions around us, uh, the Old Testament sort of religious superiority or conquest strategy is certainly not for us today. Uh, religious pluralism exists, right? But that's not the same as the polytheism of the Old Testament, which I'll get more into. Uh, today, I think what we have differently is we're trying to respect the people in other religions around us, uh, even allow for an understanding that there is one God, so God may be at work to some degree in other expressions of religion. Um, I'll give you a personal example that helps me. Maybe it will help you. I remember in my undergraduate work, I did a couple of uh, degrees to be a high school English teacher in a former life, it seems, uh, back when I was early 20s. Um, Old Dominion, one of the easy A's that I thought, I would get an easy A, take this elective class called Music Appreciation. <laughs> Loved it. I've always, you know, I grew up playing music, music in my house, music in church, and all these, learn different instruments, love it, right? So Music Appreciation, get an easy A, and we went through this, you know, broad spectrum of all this classical music, and even at that time, some pop music, Madonna was like on top 40, if anybody remembers that name not to get into that, but, uh, but I listened to all these different things. Even Garth Brooks, you know, at the early part of his career, um, I listened to a lot of Garth Brooks, but it didn't convert me to country music. And I'm, hey, sorry if I'm disappointing you, but even to this day, as much as I've been exposed to country music, it's kind of not my thing, it's not my natural inclination, uh, but that's not, you know, good or bad, and I'm just talking about music, right? Uh, even today, I would maintain Beethoven is the greatest composer. Now, just saying, I don't always listen to classical music on the car, ride over, listen to contemporary Christian music, a lot of different genres. I can appreciate music across a wide spectrum. So I can do the same thing with religion, but it doesn't make me a Buddhist or something like that. I don't believe I'm worshiping other gods. 
knowing that there is one God, I can recognize truth and wisdom in many different packages, uh, which is fine. But what I want you to know about the Old Testament, that, that time there was so much more at stake. It wasn't about appreciating these cults. It was about staying away from practices that would corrupt because in Egypt, most of these people, God's Hebrew people, were born into it and grew up with it, and it was hard for them to let go of these various gods and practices that came along with the pagan worship. So um, what I'm amazed at when I read Exodus is just how much God's grace is evident. You see God's grace and God's heart in, in the way that God forgives people who don't deserve it. And for me, that is just so different from all the other religions, you know, and I see that today. You know, I can appreciate another religion, but I see in Christ, God showing such grace and forgiveness. And my God is the God of second chances and a hundred and second chances. And, and that's wonderful. So different from a performance based religion uh, where you, you have to perform well and measure up well. Uh, thanks be to God for God's grace. And if you can see God's grace in the book of Exodus, even, I think we're reading the same. Um, back to this struggle with other religions. Let me also challenge your thinking about <clears throat> ancient pagan religious influence because it's still alive. We still have to be thoughtful of it today. Understand our culture, America, and our church, whichever church you're a part of, Big C Church, Christianity today, is certainly intertwined with pagan worship. What? How, how could that be? What, in, what is that pastor talking about? Yes, even Christianity today is intertwined with a multitude of previous primitive world religions influence. So if you're confused, let me just give you real quick. See if you can find the word Easter in the Bible. Or what does it mean? Where does it come from? I'll, I'm going to leave that for you. Maybe we'll fully answer that question in April. That's when Easter arrives in a few weeks. Uh, but my point is, yes, in real life today, we're still somewhat living among the Canaanites. And we're influenced by secularism and religious pluralism. So what do we do? Let's live the faith that we have been taught. Let's show the grace that God has shown to us and, and live with a life witness. You know, I, this comes to me because I take walks in my neighborhood. So as I'm reading this Exodus story, I'm also out um, the other day when it was nicer, not yesterday, ran into a neighbor of mine who's Muslim. And what's interesting is like, you know, should I try to press my faith a little bit and see, you know, but he is so friendly. He is probably one of the deepest thinkers. I've only known him for a short while, but while he's walking his dog and I'm exercising, we'll stop and immediately he seems to trust me with issues of life and death. And we're talking about, you know, life after death. And it's so interesting the things we have in common. Uh, whereas, you know, if I took a different approach or he took a different approach, we could be not only strangers, we might be enemies or sort of in some big debate or whatever. But my point is, I hope something about the faith that I hold is evident to him. And my life witness could be something. Uh, so in our day and time, we don't have this exodus strategy of driving others out, but rather live in such a way that we draw other people in, right? Draw people in toward the faith in the God most high. Um, so I give that as a reflection because this is pretty strong language. Let's read on because uh, it's a pretty strong language. God's promises here uh, carving out this place, the promised land. So you'll break down their pillars, cut down their sacred poles. Told you what that was. Verse 14 you shall worship no other God because the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. And we've got to talk about this some more. You shall not make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. Um, there it is, repeated again. So this is obviously um, some emphasis that God is putting on this, and we should try to understand it. Um, this would be the, the breaking down of their pagan altars. This would be after God has driven them out. So again, it's not God forcing the Hebrew people into war, but it's more of a cleanup, deconstruction project after the fact, not a religious offensive. 
by the Hebrews, but a way of establishing their worship with the tabernacle, which all of that gets re-described over the next chapters. Um, in, in verses 14 and 15 that I just read, there's a problem. There's a problem internal to the people of God, the Hebrew people, especially with their men, God telling Moses ahead of time, their men will be tempted by foreign women. This is not to put the foreign women in a bad light. I'm trying to, I think what the Exodus is trying to say, <clears throat> pay attention men. This is about the weakness of men following the lust of their eyes and the flesh and the repetition of these Torah admonitions about these practices. Well, <clears throat> it's necessary. If you've ever known a young man or perhaps like me or been a young man, God knows. Okay, the weakness of a young man wanting to attract a young wife to please her. Yes, he'll go to her religious functions. He'll go to that potluck pig picking at the, and not supposed to eat pigs, right? The pig picking down at the primitive pagan poles that they have. Yeah, he'll do all of that for her because of the weakness of men. Just trying to, I, I think that, I think I'm reading this right. I think that's kind of the problem under these verses here. Um, God says he's jealous. We've got to talk about that for a minute. So a word about the word jealous. And we've been here before. I've tried to give you some perspectives on this, but I haven't given you this quote yet. Uh, and the point is, God's name is jealous, or God, God is defined as jealous. It's a pretty strong statement. And we've said before, it's not to make God petty. It's not to make God overly humanized, as if God were weak like me. So let me give you this quote from one of my favorite preachers, the Reformed preacher. When I say Reformed, you might hear Baptist. Any Baptist friends of mine in here? It's cool. Uh, yeah. In, in um, 19th century England, my favorite preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. So if you haven't read any Spurgeon yet, you should at the very least pick up the devotional book, Morning and Evening. Wonderful, wonderful little daily devotions. If you like the upper room, you're going to love this, Morning and Evening by Spurgeon. I know I'm a Methodist, I'm not supposed to advertise my Baptist friends, but I'm doing it. <laughs> Edit that out of the tape. Seriously, I'm sorry, just in a funny mood. Uh, Spurgeon said once about this verse, and I quote, Not that God is jealous so as to bring him down to the likeness of men, but that this is the nearest idea we can form of what the divine being feels if it be right to even use that word toward him, when he beholds his throne, that is, in human hearts, occupied by false gods, his dignity insulted, his glory usurped by others. We cannot speak of God except by using figures drawn from his works or our own emotions. We ought, however, when we use these images, to caution ourselves and those who listen to us against the idea that the infinite mind is really to be compassed and described by any metaphors, however lofty, or any language, however weighty. In other words, God is always beyond words. But what do we have to describe God but our own language and our own familiar things, like our own emotions, our own reactions? So we could certainly understand, because God is moral and just and right, that jealousy is something he's going to feel when instead of God being on the throne of our hearts, we put something or someone else. Another word, uh, to quote a different commentator, you might want to choose when you, if, if, stumble, if, if jealous is a stumbling word, then maybe impassioned. God really cares about us, and that's why God's described with these types of feelings when we are tempted, or certainly when we fail and sin, like these Hebrews did, uh, by other ways. Now, there's another word that I need to say a word about, and that's another word that no one wants to hear, but the word is heard here in the word prostitution. All right, where, where did we see that? Let me keep on reading verse 15. Uh, not going to have covenant with the inhabitants of Canaan. For when they prostitute themselves to other gods, sacrifice to their gods, some among them will invite you, and you will eat of the sacrifice. I just described that, how particularly young men might want to carouse with these others. And uh, verse 16, you will take wives among their daughters for your sons. Their daughters will prostitute themselves to their gods, and you shall make your sons also prostitute themselves. 
to their gods. My goodness, this is just all through here, right? So just let me say a word about this, um, and we'll try to move on. God bless you. Uh, prostitution, they've said, it's the oldest profession. It's wrong, right? What could be worse than prostitution? Interestingly, in the Torah, we have already learned that there is a broken economic system. I mean, every culture, every time, we have failures in economics that would make some people on the bottom uh, do very base things, uh, things that are immoral, in order to survive, have bread on the table, so on and so forth. So what could be worse than prostitution is when somebody is not forced out of like a destitute situation to do that, but does it willingly or does it in some way uh, in God's name? Well, that's what's happening in these pagan cults is that they use sexuality and they use it uh, in, in terrible ways. Here's what I mean. They use it with and against children. So that, if nothing else, um, that might turn your stomach. That would be the biggest problem. It's interesting, uh, prostitution often brought up in the Bible, but even though we know it's wrong, there are also exceptions. We think about how God can work through any kind of person, and God proves that in Scripture. We have the story of Rahab at the uh, scene of Jericho, and she becomes one of the heroines to help God's people to win that battle. In the New Testament, we learn of several Reformed prostitutes whom Jesus forgave and loved and who followed Jesus. Um, so, you know, there's, in some ways, in our culture, we have a preoccupation with sexuality and sexual immorality. And in the Bible, you know, it's interesting how these things come up. What, what seems to be most often decried, not prostitution or even homosexuality, what's most often decried in the Bible is the temple prostitute or the pagan primitive sexuality uh, that comes in many forms, but quite often the prostitution of young boys, which today we would call pedophilia. Um, so again, that's what's warned about here, is that even their young men would be taken into some form of pagan cult-like prostitution. Um, uh, and, and I think today when we read it in English, we react to prostitution in, in the ways that we quite often categorize people into sort of these broad generalizations. So I just want you to understand a little bit more of the texture and some of the nuance here. Um, but it's human nature to kind of put people into groups, right? And sort of exclude them as if, you know, God doesn't care about them. Or uh, do we exclude a group wholesale and think that God can't reach a person there? Uh, it happens in every day, in every culture. In the time of Jesus, it was the Samaritans, by the way. Nothing to do with sexuality. I'm talking about a tribe of God's own people who were worshiping not in Jerusalem. So all of the southern uh, Jewish people, southern, so I'm going to speak about the southern, um, you know, they seem to be, we're the right, we're, we're the, in, the in class, the in group, right? Because we worship in the temple, the real temple, the one in Jerusalem. So all the Samaritans are going to hell. All the Samaritans are the bad people. But who did Jesus lift up? Jesus was often with that group that felt they were the outcast, and Jesus had a story. What was it called? The Good Samaritan. That's right. <laughs> Where he spent that whole afternoon talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. You're not supposed to talk to women in public if you're a Jewish man, uh, and a Samaritan nonetheless. But what I'm pointing at is we might have a group of people that we think, you know, they're outcast or they don't deserve God or what have you. Who is it for you? Who's your group that you think the least of? Is it the Muslim? You know, I struggle with it. Is it the terrorist? Is it the Russian? Is it somebody in an LGBTQ community? Who is it for you? God may surprise you or disappoint you, depending on your point of view, by reaching them. Final little aside here. Understand this is the point of the story of Jonah. Remember Jonah? Went from your kid's Sunday school class is all about the whale. But it, it's about Jonah's heart. I mean, he went the way of running away on a boat and ended up in the fish uh, because he didn't want to deal with those people. Who were those people? The Ninevites were like enemies of God. And so he finally relents and he goes there and he preached. Get this. The, the, you don't want to miss this. Because Jonah finally did what God asked and preached, the people listened and they were converted 
and God saved them, happy ending, right? No, the story, the very short book of Jonah actually ends with Jonah sulking. He's pouting because God saved people that he didn't like. And so the moral of the story is, don't be a Jonah. And, and actually, what if God were to love the people that I don't love? You know, wouldn't you want a God like that who forgives and converts your enemies? I mean, the, the hopefulness that we have when we read about ancient primitive people and the Canaanites and everything is that somehow God loves everybody. And don't we want to root for a God who might change hearts and minds and convert even whoever we think of as the outcast or the enemy or what have you? Amen. I, I want a God like that. So we don't understand over all this time how God will drive out these other peoples, how God will provide for them and care for them. But we trust God and we learn the lesson from the Hebrews that we should be following God's ways and not be tempted or distracted or led astray. Verse 17, no cast idols. This seems to jump off the page compared to what we were just talking about as a direct reference to that golden calf incident. God's now making a list. And by the way, don't do that again. You shall not make cast idols. It doesn't say golden calf, but you know that that just happened. So that, that's got to be part of what's going on there. Verse 18, um, you shall keep the festival of unleavened bread. We were just in all these other heavy topics, and now we're going back to feasts, festivals, and food. Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> this is what happens in Exodus. God will repeat again and again. Why? These are the rituals that replace all of that, you know, rowdy revelry, all of that primitive pagan sexuality. God is desexualizing religion. That's for the home. No, no sex in public, no, none of this pagan stuff. Here's what you do in public. You come together in worship that pleases God. First is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Seven days shall, verse 18, eat the unleavened bread as I commanded you at the appointed time in the month of Abib. Now remember, it's all about the Exodus being remembered rightly placed in their regular ritual once a year. It's in the springtime, so it's, it's coming up. It's around this time where you think about God did this for you. Unleavened bread. Why? Remember, in Egypt, that's where they invented leavening. It's as if, now God forbid this were ever happen, but it's as if, think about it this way. If God were trying to get people to forget about the practices, the food of Italy, then God would say, no pasta or pizza. Whew, that would be hard. But anyway, it, it's similar. It's similar. So that's why the, the focus is on the unleavened bread. So you remember rightly, God takes you out of Egypt, and God wants to take the Egypt out of you and all those temptations that come with it. Verse 19, the firstborn. All that first opens the womb is mine, says the Lord. All your male livestock, firstborn of the cow, the sheep, the donkey, you shall redeem with a lamb. If you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Wow. Why the hate for the donkey? Anyway, you may not be asking that question, but I, I was curious. So this is a bit of a repetition. We went through some of these details earlier on in the book of Exodus, but for a quick reminder, the firsts. So the firstborn among your livestock, the first fruits of your crop, offer to the Lord. This is an offering of gratitude. This is trust that God provides. So that's the emphasis on the first, you know, that if this is your first paycheck, you know, you may want to say, I better hold on to that. Or if this is your first calf that is born, oh, thank God we got a calf, but I better hold on to that. That's really important. God says, start with gratitude and return that to God. So that's the understanding, the theology behind it. But what's wrong with the donkey is the donkey's not kosher like a pig. You know, it's not fit for sacrifice in the ritual that comes along with the tabernacle. So you exchange it for a lamb. And if not, then you have to kill the first donkey. It's like a do-it-yourself, a DIY ritual sacrifice to, to dispose of the firstborn donkey. Um, all firstborn sons you shall redeem. Again, it became a practice that was a ritual offering to God or a regular way of saying, even my firstborn son, which is so important in the family, but we offer to God, and, and it was paid a very small amount of money, so it didn't 
hurt the poor at all, uh, but it was a way of offering to God, even though your son wasn't going to go into ministry or priesthood, uh, but you would do that regular offering. Again, here, look, you see this is not a separate verse at the end of 19, but it's set apart in our English translations as its own paragraph. No one shall appear before me empty-handed. I tease that that's the um, appropriation added here by the finance committee. Um, you know, it's halfway joking. Isn't it true in every error, every time frame, God has always provided for the ways of God's people and the worship ways and the priesthood uh, by the generosity of people. And so, you know, in part, these are symbolic acts. In part, they are the animal sacrifices for the ritual. But remember, this replaces the pagan practices of human sacrifice specifically. Thanks be to God. So already this is an upgrade, the Torah, the law, the way of God. Uh, verse 21, forgive me, it's a bit repetitive as we go through Exodus. Um, this is about the Sabbath observation. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh rest, even plowing and harvest time. So what's added here is a reminder that, you know, people are very, in an agrarian society, when that harvest is ready, uh, a Saturday or a Sunday, hey, we got to get it while it's good, before the frost or before the rains or floods or whatever the case may be. But God says, take a rest even during those busy seasons. Um, so the only way probably for us to compare to that comes to mind is, let's say you only had 12 days left of shopping before Christmas. Yeah, even stop shopping on the Sabbath. I mean, get, I see some of your faces like, but that's just beyond the pale to ask that. Well, that, that probably is what it sounded like to some of them that even during the harvest you shall rest. But the Sabbath is, remember, place is secondary to time. The Sabbath is God's cathedral in time. That's the temple in time before God ever had a physical temple built. Um, so thanks be to God that any one of us can worship in time. All right. You shall observe festival of weeks, verse 22, first fruits of the wheat harvest. We've gone through. Uh, in previous sessions, uh, the various festivals of the year gave you a handout on all that. Uh, but look at verse 23. Three times in the year your males shall appear before God. Now, I get this question. Um, please understand. You can, I, do I even need to say this out loud? You can always disagree with me. You can have a different perspective on this, and many do. But people will ask, um, it sounds a little chauvinistic. All your males appear before God. They're, they think they're special. Actually, quite the opposite is what's happening here. Women were certainly part of those who would go up three times a year. Quite often women did it. But it's written for the males because women were not required because God and therefore the leadership of Israel, men, respect women's work. Yes, the men respect. It's not required of the women, but they certainly may come. But it's respected, not rejected. Uh, women's work, keeping the house, keeping the children, doing the things that they do six days a week, six and a half days, however they have to do it, right? Um, still feeding the child on the Sabbath. So they're, they're working all the time. Um, now, I will cast out, verse four, uh, 24, again, is the sort of driving out the other nations. In a larger borders, no one shall covet your land when you go up and appear before the Lord your God three times a year. Here's God's reassurance because the men would be fearful to leave their wives and children and their land and their homes. And so God is saying, no one else, I've driven people out, so no one else is going to come and burglarize your home when you're gone or you know, mistreat your family and so on. So uh, protection and assurance from the Lord. Therefore, the men can leave home three times a year. Verse 25, you shall not offer blood sacrifice with leaven. Again, about the leaven. The sacrifice of the festival of Passover shall not be left until morning. So here are some real detailed reminders. 26, the best of the first fruits of your ground shall you shall bring to the Lord. You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. That's a baby goat, that kind of kid. Don't get confused. <laughs> Don't get confused. The offering of child sacrifice, human sacrifice, that's done. That's not the issue here. Um, but we went through this because it's a curious command. Uh, we went through this some chapters ago, so I don't need to remind you, but here's a quick reminder if you want. It was obviously part of a pagan ritual. 
Prob probably so. M many commentators think so. So again, this is a way of differentiating oneself from the polytheism of Egypt or even in the land of Canaanites where they do this thing. You should not do this thing, boiling a goat in its mother's milk. Yuck. All right. Yeah, pro probably not an issue or temptation for you today, right? Okay. That's an easy one. Lord gave us some easy ones to obey. Verse 27, the Lord said to Moses, write these words in accordance with these words. I have made the covenant with you in Israel. He was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. Um, getting very serious here, thinking about Moses, thinking about Moses communing closely with God. 40 days and 40 nights. Listen now, verse 28. He neither ate nor drank water. So it's a miracle. I mean, there's no other way to interpret this except that, that God, it's a miracle. Because you can live, what, three minutes without air, three days without water, maybe 30 days without food. You know, it's basically. I mean, you can stretch those a little bit depending on who you are, but it has to be the Lord. 40 days and 40 nights. You hear the, the number 40 repeated. We, we remember that from the story of Noah. And it rained for 40 days. 40 is a symbol of completion. So quite literally, Moses could have been up there for 40 days and 40 nights. Yes. But it also means that it was a fullness of time. We think time chronologically. God thinks time in terms of God's fulfillment, like the ripening of fruit. It may take a certain number of days, but it's not about the days. It's about when it's just right. And so the biblical language has different words for that. Um, chronos for chronological time. Kairos for that ripening, right timing, more like timing, like music has timing to it. Um, so God had Moses up there for the right amount of time, the fullness of time, so that their relationship was solid and he was ready with, again, the Ten Commandments. He wrote, ending verse 28, on the tablets, the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, and Moses came down, verse 29, came down the mountain. So just imagine this, be, be right here in this story. As he came down the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. And Aaron and the Israelites saw Moses. The skin of his face was shining. and They were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, Aaron and all the leaders. But Moses spoke with them. Verse 32. Afterward, all the Israelites came near. He gave the, the in commandment that the Lord had spoken to him on. Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak to him in the tent, he, he would take off the veil until he came out. When he came out, he told the Israelites all that he'd been commanded. Verse 35, and the Israelites would see the face of Moses. The skin of his face was shining and Moses would put on the veil on his face again. It, his veiling um, is less of a spiritual thing, more of a humble. I think it's a humble thing where Moses didn't want any people to feel intimidated around him because they were uncertain. Uh, and Moses didn't even know he had this sort of spiritual sunburn, if you will. He, he radiated. And it was so uncertain, the interpretation of this, by the way, in some of the ancient religious art, uh, iconography showed Moses with horns coming out of his head. Now, this was a difficulty in the translation. The Latin Vulgate Bible translated his face sent out horns of light. Uh, the Hebrew word for radiant has um, some similarity to the word for horn. And so it was uh, just un misunderstood and depicted with Moses, almost like with these cow-like horns. And so, you know, some have interpreted it as uh, they're confusing Moses with sort of the god of the cow. You know, that's the Egyptian god or the golden calf issue. Uh, maybe it had to do with that. No, it was just a confusion about the word radiant. But if you, in our imagination today, if you could just imagine Moses glowing, maybe he has kind of got a shiny complexion. Maybe it's beet red, however you want to see that, but no need for horns. Um, it's a reality of being in the presence and in the power of God in the powerful presence of God. But here's my closing thought, and I'll take some questions and answer. Think about Moses, because so much of this story is about the character of Moses and our character today. God cares so much for God's people, 
He's forming our moral and spiritual character. Consider our hero Moses. What joy he must have had being so close with God so long on the mountaintop. To be so close, he was even given a glimpse of God's glory. Think about how Moses must feel completely peaceful, forgiven, blessed, whatever good feelings or words that come to mind, that closeness. Think of the elation, the high spirits Moses must have had. And what else did Moses experience? Each time he comes down the mountain, he comes back to very human people. So Moses has the blessings of God, but also the burdens of humanity, the burdens of the failures of his people. He feels the depths of their betrayal, of their stiff-necked obedience. And Moses can hold both. Think about Moses. In Moses, we find the kind of person of faith who can hold both the good things and the bad. He can hold both the divinity and the humanity. And and it doesn't tear them apart. I I think it's amazing. While while you certainly see the tension and and the difficulty, and Moses is not perfect, he doesn't always handle it well, but we see an example of faith. So as I close, I just want to leave it with you as maybe a question for your devotional time, for your prayer life. If Moses can hold that, how about you? What an amazing gift, the heart that God gives people, the heart that can hold so much. We can hold in our hearts the joy of a grandchild, uh, the blessings of life as we know it among friends and uh, people here, uh, faith community and loving, forgiving and helpful people. And we can hold in our hearts the heartbreak of Ukraine. Uh, We read the news, we see the pictures, our hearts go out to people. We can hold in our hearts the uh, death of a loved one, um, the grief that we feel. And and God allows us or strengthens us or blesses us with the opportunity to do both. I mean, that's just who we are as human beings, right? Kind of the both and, both the burden and the blessing. And both have with it the very presence of God. Amazing. Uh, Just want to leave you with that thought. Um, I'll take time for a little questions and answers. I know some of you need to get to something else at 11. Yeah, back row. Sure. This is trivial. Right. Oh, no, she said this is a trivial question. I don't think it's a trivial question. Um, I'm not sure I got the best answer. (laughs) Of course. Um, The chronology is hard to follow. So over time, you have, I think, um, we've even quoted some of the rabbis. I'm not going to do a great job. Um, You have this sense that Exodus was written, and there's a certain story flow to it. And then Moses' uh, friends or scribes would add back to it more detail about the feasts and the different things as they develop the tabernacle practice. So... The males will go three times a year, she says. Where are they going? Well, eventually they go to Jerusalem to the temple. But there's so many years where there is no temple, either prior to the temple or after the destruction of the first temple. And then there was the second temple when Jesus was around. And then there's the destruction of the second temple. So making the festival and wherever they could make the festival, um, uh, they would go to the Lord. So it's a wonderful question. I wish I had a more chronologically precise answer. Did you know it's still a viable practice in the Jewish uh, ritual? Uh, that that was still dropped off? Yeah, it's really dropped off. Now, others among us may know better, but Jews have had, and they call it a diaspora, uh, that is dispersed uh, throughout the world. And one of the things I love about that is Jews are known by their story, faith, belief in God, particularly the story of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, not by a place or even an ethnicity. So God has kind of made them supranational, a nation that is above just what one place. Um, so certain types of Jews will observe things more specifically. Um, there is not the temple in, you know, where the Temple Mound is now in Jerusalem is actually a mosque 
it's a Muslim place. There's the Wailing Wall, which is a corner of the stones of the second temple in the time of Jesus. And many will go there. And Jerusalem is still thought to be the holy city. But it's the holy city for three of the world's major religions now, right? So Judaism first, then Christianity, and if I might say latecomer, Islam. You know, a little bit of a latecomer. What was that, years 600 or something after Jesus? Um, somewhere in there. So it's, it's not as ancient, but they kind of have the high ground. That uh, Temple Mount, the uh, place where the big mosque is in Jerusalem, is believed to be the rock. Uh, where Abraham was. So you go back, trace him all the way back to Abraham. I'm not answering a question now. I'm rambling. Sorry. We're about wrapped up.